Welcome to Well Made, where we dive deep into all things wellness, self-improvement, and self-love. I'm your host, Kat Kamalani, a mother of two beautiful kids. Together, we'll explore raw and candid moments that touch on every aspect of life, from parenting to relationships, career, and personal growth. Our conversations will be filled with insight, experiences, and tips to help you live your best life. So sit back, relax, and join us on this journey towards a happier, healthier, and more fulfilling life. Welcome back to another episode of Well Made. Today is going to be a little bit different, but for me, it hits home and it really hits home to Kaloni. We have in a really episode that is going to be life-changing and inspiring. So if this hits home to you guys, if it's inspiring, we ask you to please share it and tag us so we can personally thank you. But this is going to be about the Maui fires. And the reason why it touches home so much to me and Kehlone is because Kehlone is from Maui, but we currently reside in Utah. And then Kehlone just recently quit being a firefighter, but he also has family over in Maui that are firefighters. He has family there that have been directly impacted by this. So let's rewind a couple weeks ago. We went to Park City for my birthday and we were sleeping and we woke up the next morning and Kehlone said to me, holy moly, there's been fires there. And at the time when you told me, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I didn't understand the impact or how big it was. And I first said to him, oh my gosh, like that's horrible. How many houses, just like a couple houses. And he's like, no, it wiped out everything. Well, I was just in awe because you know, I'm used to seeing these kind of things, uh, like fires and wildfires, homes being burnt, but the scale of which I was seeing and it was being recorded just live, right? Like all this stuff was coming in straight from the people right to my phone. And I'm like, what is going on? This is extraordinary and something I've never seen before. So yeah, it was super, super crazy. So for those viewers and listeners who aren't familiar with Stacy and Slater, they are doing such amazing things in Maui. They live in Maui, and I want to jump over to you guys and tell me, how did you find out? And then after you find out, what was your first initial reaction and what are the steps that you did after that? Yeah, so again, like I think everyone, like your guys' story and so many other stories, it was just kind of like, what is going on? Just mass social media hysteria and just mm-hmm. kind of trying to find answers and, and what's happening, but just like really gruesome, scary videos coming out. and. So for us, kind of, so we had been traveling all summer on the mainland and visiting family and friends, and we were so ready and so excited to get home. Stacy is pregnant, and so we're like, we're going to get home and get into the nesting phase, and we're just so stoked on the next steps. And uh, we had one more trip before flying home to Maui, and we went to Denver, Colorado for a friend's wedding, and it was like the final hurrah of our summer. We were so looking forward to this wedding, some of our really dear friends. And we had just landed in Denver that night. And I remember I got a text from my dad who was also traveling, him and my mom. And they live uh, in a neighborhood about 15 minutes south of us. And so um, they're kind of above Lahaina. Where do you live right now, Slater? We live in Kahana. So we're like 10 minutes north of Lahaina. Okay, perfect. Um, Sorry. Northwest Maui. My parents live in Lani Poco, which is a community up the hill, just slightly south of Lahaina Town. And and there, it's oh, there's always fires there. Every year, there's brush fires up there. Um, so we're pretty used to that. But I remember my dad texting me that night. It was late in Colorado. And he texted us a photo of his property. His neighbor had gone down to his property to check on it, to take a picture of it. Because the wind for multiple days prior to that was as bad as... People who have lived here their whole lives, 30, 40 years, have said they've never seen the wind that strong and consistent. And so he texted us this video of his property just completely shredded. I mean, trees over, all his landscaping just derooted and just like devastating winds. And this is before the fire. So I remember going to bed being like, so sorry about your yard. When we get home, I'll help you guys kind of try to revitalize it. And um, the wind should stop soon. We go to bed. and I, then- I woke up first the next morning and I just checked my phone, went on Instagram, and all of these videos were just on my home feed of Lahaina burning to the ground. And I was just like in shock. I immediately started crying. And I was like, Slater, I was like, Lahaina is on fire. He's like, what do you mean? And I was like, look at these videos. And it was just like one after the other, just like all these videos online of Lahaina burning down. And I was just like in shock. I was like, I couldn't believe it. And so we started like 
trying to call like our friends and family that live here just to check on them. We couldn't get a hold of like anybody because the service was down here. So we couldn't get like updated information of what was happening in real time. And so we had no idea if our home was even, you know, still here. We didn't know if it had burned, like we didn't know how far the fires had traveled. So we were just like kind of in a panic because we didn't really know what to do and we couldn't get into contact with anybody. So we didn't have that communication. So it was kind of just like we were sitting ducks and we were just like, okay, like what can we do? We just have to kind of wait. Right. So it was, yeah, it was definitely a very emotional day, very scary. And yeah, yeah I mean, sitting in a holiday inn in <laughs> outside of Denver, you know, watching your hometown burn and I'm calling my friends and, and, and people that I know here and no one's answering. And, um, then I'm getting reports and rumors that my best friend, a, a guy who was in my wedding party, is um, I know he's the type of guy to stay and help fight and and fight his house and and use garden hoses. And so I knew he would stay back and no one could get in touch with him. And he had sent his friends away with stuff. And he's like, I'm going to stay and fight it. Mm-hmm. And so just like really scary moments where it's like your friends and family who you know are staying back to fight these fires. Like, did they survive? No one has communication. I'm talking to his parents. And like, we haven't heard from him in 24 hours. So just a lot of unknowns in those first 24 to 48 hours that were just like gut wrenching, just like, honestly, just prayers. Like you're just, you're just sitting there like hoping for the best praying and, and hoping to get answers. So you found out it was 24, 48 hours. How long was it that you guys were in Denver before you went back to Hawaii? And then when you went back to Hawaii, what was your first steps when you went back there? So we, right away, yeah. we tried to go back as soon as possible. Um, but the plan was first to go to Oahu just because I'm pregnant and like, we didn't know like the air quality. Or, sure. Your like, safety anything. first. And yeah. And like the water quality, there's no power at our house. So we were just like, okay, let's go to Oahu. We have a bunch of really good friends that live there. So Slater just wanted to first make sure that I would be safe there and kind of nest in with some friends. And then his plan was to come to Maui right after that. So the very next day after we heard about the fires was the earliest flight we could get to Oahu. So we flew out the next day to Oahu and then, um, and then you flew out the day after that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was, it was very much like we had like our checkout time in Denver was at like 11 and we had finally got a flight booked at like 10 50 rushed out of our room to avoid like you know, overstay fees. And like, so we were out of there as quick as possible. But at that time, we couldn't, there was no chance of getting to Maui that people were saying the airport was mm-hmm. closed and multiple flights were getting canceled. So we heard rumors of friends who were getting stuck at airports on the mainland, not able to get to Maui. And like Stacy said, main goal was to keep her safe. We wanted to get back home to Hawaii. And so we went to Oahu. We put her on, on the east side with some really good friends of ours. Um, and as soon as she was like settled in there and felt safe, my buddy Poe and I, who is a lifeguard on East Side of Oahu, uh, jumped on a little Southwest flight to Maui the next day. And we were the only ones on the flight. It was us and a couple first responders coming over. And it was just for my whole mindset was like, okay, boots on the ground. How can I help? What can I do? So I linked right up with Kyle Lenny, who is one of my best friends that I grew up with here. And he was just like full ready to go. Like I remember he picked me up from the airport. He's like, okay, let's go. What are we doing? And we went straight to Costco. Uh, loaded up on as much stuff as we, we could fit in his truck. And you guys are familiar with Maui, but for the listeners, there's really one main kind of vein going to the west side, and that's on the poly around the south end. But there is a way on the back side, Kahukuloa, which is the north side of, of the west side. And it's super sketchy. It's it's a really narrow one-lane road. And it's, it's just not a place you guys ever really want to drive. And that was the only uh, inlet and outlet that they were allowing for the first like week. And so uh, you had to show ID that you had a West Side resident. So like someone like Kai, who's not a West Side resident, he lives on the North Shore. The only way he was able to get over and help was through me or his wife, Molly, or our IDs because we had those West Side addresses. Yeah, and we got to the West Side and I remember it was just chaos. It was like local setting up hubs and uh, National Guard was there setting up and all sorts of just craziness. And, and really it was very much like, all right, Let's just take it minute by minute and see what the needs are and where we can help. I think the hardest part too was the lack of communication. Yeah. Nobody had service. Like even I would only hear from him like once a day when I was on Oahu. And so I was like, okay, I have no idea what's going on. But then he would like get service. He's like, I just went to the top of the hill. Like it was just very spotty. And so I think that was the hardest part from people on the other side of the island trying to help too, but like not being able to communicate with people on the West side. So that was definitely a challenge. Yeah. The communication was crazy because there was people in Northwest Maui let's say like Hana Kauai, Kahana, Kapalua, 
Uh, we're 10 minutes north of Lahaina Town, but they didn't even know what was going on or that Lahaina had burned. So people 10 minutes north, mm-hmm. the communication was so down that people in our neighborhood were like, what, yeah. Lahaina burnt down a few hours ago? No they way. have no idea. They yeah, so that's, that's just to give you an example of how mm-hmm. hard the communication was. Is Not that the rest of the world was trying to figure it out, but people in our neighborhood were calling family and friends on the mainland, asking them what's going on 10 minutes south of us. That's something I want to touch base, and especially with Keloni, because Keloni's brother was directly impacted by the fires. And he, I'm sure you guys are, you've seen him on social media. Um, It's Paele. Paele. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's all over. Yeah, he's done tons of interviews with people, like just the voice of the people. I was going to say you look a lot like him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's funny. But when Keloni was talking to him, it why from your guys' perspective, and a lot of listeners want to know, why is it has been so much chaos where the government hasn't stepped in? It's the people helping the people. Why is it FEMA was not in there in the first 24, 48 hours? From your guys' perspective perspective, what is happening and why aren't you guys getting the help that you guys need? It was, you know really really weird early on because when we showed up you know um i've been through natural disasters before hurricanes in florida and different places and it seems that there's always a period where there's a time where fema hasn't shown up yet or government hasn't shown up yet and what one thing you always notice is the community rallies and i've never seen a community post natural disaster like the community of hawaii like in here and in the west side of maui too it was so crazy because all of these hubs so for a long time there's like seven or eight different donation hubs and and supply hubs where people could come and get help and every single one of them we would visit them multiple times a day every day um doing logistics and supply drops and they were all locally run community leaders would put these together they'd either take over a beach park or a park or a cul-de-sac in a neighborhood and you go to these these hubs and talk to the local community and there was no county uh no state no federal officials. And this is this is not us being a conspiracy theorist or anti-government in any way. This is literally just our experience. And we were filming everything and talking to people. Hey, have you had any assistance from anyone? Have you seen any federal or state or county officials helping or donating or on the ground here? And the only people that we saw was National Guard had come and set up barricades to block people from going into Lahaina and into Front Street which is understandable. It's very toxic and dangerous post-fire, right? So they're trying to keep people out of going into the burn zone, which I get, but that was their main job. It was it was security. It was, hey, we're blocking off this section. It wasn't, hey, we're here to help you guys build infrastructure for hubs. Hey, we're here to hand out water, food and supplies. That was all locals. And and it, there was a lot of like the terminology going around during that time was Kanat Costco. So it was like this, like local guys setting up You know, these big, you could walk through the beach park and like, okay, I can get beans and rice. Okay, I can get clothes. Okay, baby stuff. Um, Okay, medicine. It was literally like grocery stores set up by locals. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was 100% a local run effort. It took some time. You know, government officials did eventually show up. But I mean, it was a solid week before we saw anybody. So in your opinion, why why is it that it took so long? And um, like, do you feel like the government just was in chaos at that time? Like they didn't know what to do or how to respond to this because it's never happened before? Yeah, I don't, it's so weird because it, that's something that I've been like rolling around in bed at night thinking about like, why would they not be here early on? They, they Everyone knew what was going on. Everyone saw the destruction, the damage. We have one of the largest military bases on Oahu. That's a, you know, a Black Hawk can get here in 15 minutes. You know, how come we had, I had people DMing me these military wives on Oahu DMing me saying, hey, my husband's in the Air National Guard. Hey, my husband's Air Force. Hey, uh, husband is a Marine. They're like just just chomping at the bit to be deployed and come help. All they want to do is just get aircraft up and go help. But they can't be deployed without, you know, commands from their surgeon or their general who takes commands from the governor or the president. And so they were just kind of stuck in idle over on Oahu. And I know the people of the military and first responders there were just dying to help us. But yeah. their, their upper command wasn't giving them the green light to come over and do it. And so that was really hard and weird to. Yeah, I, I have know. no idea why. And I think a lot of people are kind of upset and angry and questioning that, too. Rightfully um, so. But 
yeah, yeah. I just don't even have an answer for that. Well, and, you know, looking back, it was it was like a really, really fragile time for a lot of the community members, of course, from losing their homes and loved ones. But, you know, we're not getting assistance really right off the bat from the government. So people are kind of angry about that. And then, you know, the governor comes out and one of his first kind of public speeches, he's talking about how the state wants to buy the land and how, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're going to try to purchase the land to help build housing for people. And and when you just lost everything and then the governor is saying we're going to purchase up all the land and help you guys out. Everyone's like, well, no, we don't want you to purchase the land. We want you to give us our land back. Mm-hmm. So saying things like that in such a fragile time where mm-hmm. these Hawaiians have been here for hundreds of years in these Hawaiian homes and, and family homes that are six, seven generations. And then you have someone come in and say, Hey, the state's going to buy that from you. It, it just kind of rubbed people the wrong way. And that's when people started kind of getting angry. So I don't think people understand how sacred these lands are. And even me being married to a Kanaka and being in the culture for the last decade, I don't even think I understand how sacred it is. I think I have an understanding, but I truly don't until you're in the shoes. And Keloni's family, they own some property in Kihei, and it is the most gorgeous property ever right on the cliff. It's, I would say, millions of dollars is his great-grandmother's property. And I've asked him, like, oh, what are you guys going to do if whenever she passes away, are you going to sell it? And he's like, we would never sell this land ever. Like someone can come to us and offer $50 million. The the land of Hawaii is so important to those people. And I don't people, I just, it tears me apart of like, what are the alternative motives? And speaking of alternative motives, I've had so many people on my social media come up with all these conspiracy theories. I mean, crazy ones where there's a laser. I mean, they're blocking the road in and out. And I don't know if that really happened or it could be conspiracy theory. Um, Not not having water access to fight the fire, just like, just crazy, just crazy stuff to actually, it seemed like it was done on purpose, but what um, are your guys' thoughts thoughts? on that? Well, I think that like, you know, and also another, we just figured out the other day, we were were at Home Depot picking up some supplies and Stacy was like, I just had an inkling. And I was like, what? She said, She's like, the fires happened on 808. Like, how weird is that? August 8th. <laughs> Why did the fires happen on 808? 808. That is you wild. Know, I didn't even put that together not still. Not that. <laughs> I, have you guys seen that on social media? Has anyone talked about that? I haven't, I haven't seen that anywhere. And Stacy literally yesterday was like, oh my gosh, this just hit me. This was on 808. So, I mean, we could go down the rabbit hole. Hey, for those who don't know, 808 is the area code for Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. And so... And so, of course, we go down the rabbit hole and have some fun with it and get crazy. But at the end of the day, a lot of this conspiracies have, have really kind of been debunked. Like, so as I was telling you guys before this conversation started, there's a, a guy named Kimo Clark here, and he is lived on Maui his whole life. He's Hawaiian. He's got generations here, and he's, he's really embedded deep in our community. Um, he owns um, a company called Truex, which is an excavation company. So he's got a bunch of heavy equipment. He his house burned down and the first day he was in there working with FEMA with his excavation equipment, you know, digging through buildings, trying to help find remains. And he's been there working every day since for the last month. And so he's really someone I trust because he's maybe the most boots on the ground local that, that I know here actively every day. Um, and he has a really good video on his Instagram. It's about 10 minutes long. I highly recommend people go look him up and just watch it. He goes step by step over all the kind of most popular conspiracies and really just gives you his perspective on them from fighting the fire since the first minute. He has video of how the fire started above Lahaina Luna with the power line that tipped over the first spark. So he has uh, um, was there, has a lot of content based around that. And then ever since then has been working there, helping recover bodies and remains. And so he's a really good guy to know. His Instagram is true, T-R-U dot X life. And we'll um, put this in the dis- Clark. description. Put it, yeah, put in the description. Um, scroll down a little bit, guys. Look at his video. It's called Behind a Fire Conspiracy Theory. It's titled really cool 10 minute video, just kind of um, going over his experiences being on the ground here. But yeah, it's again, what we talked about the really sensitive time after the fire, you know, and some kind of insensitive comments from government officials and chaos and loss. And then, you know, you check social media and it's like, you know, a laser burnt Maui and the government burnt it down in 15 minute cities and all the conspiracies started coming out. And 
there's a time and a place for that discussion. But I think with the aftermath of those fires, it's like, hey, we need to let these people grieve. We need to let our community grieve. We have to have time to process. And when you're trying to grieve the loss of everything, and then people are saying that the government shot a laser to murder people, you're like, yeah. it's a little insensitive right off the bat. And I know that's how social media works, but that was kind of the initial thoughts. I, I'm i going to take a step back and I'm going to let you guys answer this because I don't feel like um, I'm qualified to answer this. But my question for you, Kiloni, and then we'll jump it over to you guys, is that going forward, I get asked a lot on my messages is tourists allowed over there? And if they are allowed over there, should they even go over there? So what are your thoughts about tourists visiting Maui right now? It's so hard because I'm seeing, I'm, I'm at a distance, so I'm not even there. I haven't been there since it's happened. I have seen that the governor's trying to open it up in October or something, West Maui. So I don't know. It's, it, it seems like it's it's a bit soon for that kind of stuff to happen, especially on the West side. You guys can tell me your thoughts. I, I feel like you know, if they're visiting other parts of the island and West Side Maui is just like off limits would be my my thoughts. But what do you what do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's like mixed reviews as well. I think that people just need to come with respect. And yeah, I don't know. How do you feel about? Well, it, it, it's I know, such a I know a lot of people are like on the West Side are suffering businesses, you know, like they need they need tourism. So it's, it's kind of hard because we see both sides of it. We see, you know, the businesses that we want to support and we want to see them thrive and, and they're struggling too right now. So it's, it's kind of hard because we want to support the local businesses and communities that need help right now. But at the same time, it's like, we just need people to come with respect and we don't want, you know, it to just go back to normal and people Stacey, just like, elaborate on that. Back. What, what do you mean? Exactly. I know what you mean, but I want the listeners to hear from you guys. What do you mean exactly when you say travel with respect? What does that look like? I think just like not coming in and, you know, taking photos, posting on social media, being insensitive, just really like if you're going to come to the West Side, offer some volunteer services, come and help at, you know, hand out food or do something, you know, like if you're going to come to the West Side, don't just come to snorkel at Napili Bay, like come and give back to the community in some way. So I think like enjoy your vacation, but also maybe you can like take some time during your vacation to help the community in some way. And I think that level of respect for the community and just knowing you know, people here are struggling and how can I help? I think that would kind of make the difference between like tourists coming here and just, you know, being on vacation and then just giving back and helping. Yeah. And like, like Stacey was saying, like it's, it's really is a touchy subject and that's kind of been the debate I would say in the last couple of days or week. Um, Cause every, every couple of days or week, the narrative changes and things change and the conversation updates and just, you know, talking with the guys this, this last week was, the conversation was mostly about tourism coming back because the governor had mentioned that they're going to open the west side for tourism october 8th um and again that was like kind of a shock to a lot of people because that's two months post post disaster when you say west really side slater it, are you're not talking lahaina right you're talking the cities like what are the cities behind lahaina are oh, you talking whatever. lahaina yeah. so yeah so 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 lahaina basically is stretching from you know, Ukumehame after you get off the poly all the way up to, you know, Kapalua, north of Honolulu Bay, and then you go around Kokoloa. So really we're talking about the entire West Side. And I think that when the governor is talking about opening up the West Side, they mean opening up on the poly. Well, the businesses that yeah. are still operational on, on the West Side, right? And there's there are some businesses operational. There's there's Airbnbs in Lane Poco, which is south of Lahaina, and then obviously Kanapali, which is like one of our biggest tourist hubs and and main strips of hotels here on the west side kapalua so it's a super touchy subject i think that in my heart it is it does feel a little bit soon i don't know when the right time is ever going to be people lost loved ones and everything and so when do you tell them the right time is people are still grieving like so that's really hard we want to respect them but you know then you hear stories of you know and i'm not, I'm not even talking about the hilton or these giant chains of hotels i'm talking about the cyborg truck the shave ice place, the, the, you know, food truck, the pokey truck, these locals that, you know, thrive off of tourism and need tourism to survive and pay their bills. They're getting hurt horribly right now too. They didn't lose a home. They didn't lose things. Mm -hmm. They still have their house. They still have their business, but they don't have anyone to support their business. And the local community that is still here on the West side in Northwest Maui, a lot of people are financially stressed. And so it's hard for them to still go out and pay for stuff. 
And so it's really been hard on these local businesses relying on the local community. Like Stacy and I do our best to go out and buy food from these, these, these businesses and try to support them. But these places we used to wait in line at, you know, we would get all mad. We're like, oh, these tourists are here. We have to wait in line to buy a Poke Bowl. And now looking back, you know, we're like, dang, we feel really bad because those lines were supporting that person's mortgage, their family, right? Mm-hmm. So again, it's a touchy subject. I don't know if there's a right answer. I do feel in my heart it is too soon. But at the same time, I do feel for the, the locals that run businesses here that do need tourism. And I think Stacy hit the nail on the head. Like there's a respectful way to do it. What I don't want to see is a lot of the locals that were displaced are in uh, the hotels right now. Mm-hmm. And that's where their place of refuge is, where they're staying in the time being until they can find long-term solutions. I would hate to see tourism open up on the eight and those rooms get cleared for tourists. Yeah. Um, I think that is wrong. So again, it's a really, really touchy subject. Everyone has a different opinion on it. But I think at the end of the day, respect for the people that lost everything is the number one kind of goal you have to have. And if, if you can you know, look at the people that lost everything, okay, how can we respect them and grieve with them and make it work? I think there's a way, but again, it's really, really hard. I think that uh, you guys are 100% correct. And it goes even from before fires, right? Like, I think just the native community and the locals there, they just they just ask for respect. And that's that's what lacks sometimes. And so I've already seen things on social media where people are taking pictures on the West Side. I'm like, what is going on in their their brains, right? But um, I'm hoping that, you know, with, with people like us that are trying to get word out and, and um, when it does open up, that people are respectful because... I mean, souls were lost. That's that's the really yeah. the devastating thing. Yeah. People lost their lives. Yeah. You know. Well, and they're still they're yeah. still doing they're still searching for remains, right? So, like, yeah. again, how do you bring your mind to a place where a family is here snorkeling at Black Rock, mm-hmm. and they're still actively searching for remains a mile and a half south? So it's like it just it's a really weird situation. And mm-hmm. again, it's it's you know I think early on too the conversation was that. Maui is closed. Maui is closed. And Maui completely shut down. I mean, you go over to Kahului and the rental cars are piled up in the masses, in the thousands. It looks like COVID times when, when yeah. COVID hit and the governor shut Hawaii down for travel. It looked, exactly like it looked the same. And so it's, it's kind of flashbacks to that. And so Wailea, Kihei, Wailuku, Kahului, Hana, Paia, all of these big hubs that have tourism and were not affected by the fires, they've lost all of their, I have friends who work at the Four Seasons in Oilea and they text me like, hey man, a couple days after the fire, I got laid off. I'm like, you got laid off from the Four Seasons in Oilea? Yeah. And they're like, they're, we're at 2% capacity. Everyone left, they're, they're, they can't keep us. So yeah. my friends are losing jobs on the south side of the island, the north shore of the island because of the effects of this. And so I think at, a week or two after people started posting, hey, Maui is not closed. The west side is closed, but the rest of Maui is open. Please have your tourists. Please bring tourism here. Please support the locals. And I think it's unfortunate that, well, I don't know if unfortunate is the right word, but, you know, it, it's, it's you know, kind of a bummer that Hawaii is 100% reliant on tourism. Um, I wish that our economy was relying on different, different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a fact that our economy thrives on tourism and, and the locals here and the businesses here have to have tourism. And until... We have an economy shift into a different, you know, means. It's the sad truth. We, we have to have tourists and, um, and and it's hard to swallow, but it is it is what it is. So I think, it's, again, it's a touchy subject and there's a right way to do it. I don't know what that way is, but I think if we just go about everything with respect, you, you can't go wrong. So I want to touch base on what you guys were talking about with the government wanting to buy the land. We've also heard rumors of making Lahaina the first smart city. Going forward, what, in your guys' opinion, is how Lahaina should be rebuilt? Like, how should it remain? What are the proper steps for Lahaina going forward? Give the people their land back. I just feel like give the people their land back. I would love to see them just, like, build it the exact same way that it was. In the ideal world, they just try and basically recreate what it looked like keep all the buildings, you know, keep it historic looking. That's what I would love to see, honestly. Yeah. Like, Just give the people that were on the land the f- absolute first mm-hmm. right to come back yeah. and rebuild. Give them incentives to rebuild, mm-hmm. government help, money. Let them decide what they want to do with financial help. 
once those people are able to get their land back and build back what they want and need, um, then we can go over the discussion of, okay, you know, business buildings, historical buildings, that kind of stuff. But I think rule number one is get the people back on their land. And then I think too, like, it's a great opportunity now, like, how can we restore some of the culture? You know, okay, maybe how can we get some of the water diverted back to, because Lahaina was, was all wetlands, you know, back in the day, and, and now it's super dry. How can we bring some of the culture back into Lahaina? It used to be the capital of Hawaii. It, used, it had so much rich history with the Hawaiians. Like, how can we bring a little bit more of that back, you know, along with obviously the tourism and the stuff that's needed. But I think there's a way to mesh more of that because prior to the fires, Lahaina was, was front street was very much tourist based. Um, there wasn't a lot of kind of local, I mean, there was, there was historical sites you could go and visit in museums and stuff, but there wasn't a lot of things that you could do to learn about the Hawaiian culture and the history of Lahaina. And I think looking forward, how can we set up things where tourists can come and say, Hey, we can learn about tarot patches. We can learn about the way that the streams work. We can learn about the history of Lahaina. I think that that would be really special to see a little bit more of the rebuilding go towards mm -hmm. how Lahaina once was maybe a hundred years ago versus how it was a month ago, you know? Yeah. But, well, we're at such an impact, like it's such a negative impact with what happened, but we're, they have an opportunity now to do exactly that. Right. And so I'm, I'm with you guys. I'm hoping that, you know, Tourists can get their feet in a lo'i and work with some kalo, like, you know, do the historic sites correctly and just listen to the people. So, you know, government officials, they feel like they know what's best for the people. And I feel like really it just has to have to listen. Right. That's just have ears, op ears open, ears on and just do what the people want. One of the most, I would say, top five spiritual moments in my life was getting the opportunity to go into a tarot patch and to pull the tarot patch out and to clean it in the waters and be in the mountains of Maui and to replant it. And it was such a cultural, spiritual moment to me that there is not one other thing that I did in Hawaii that outweighs that. And I think something that would be so cool going forward is giving tourists an opportunity to go help build Lahaina, to give these opportunities to rebuild trees and plants and go in there and really be with the people and understand Hawaii because you don't even get to experience the beauty of Hawaii until you get to experience the beauty of the people and the culture. Yeah. yeah. And so totally. I would love to see something like that to have tourists go and help give back in that, even if it's an hour of their time to go, you know, do plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's a great idea. I think it should be mandatory. Why not make it mandatory to, yes. have, yes. to have to should. choose, okay, you, you're flying yeah. to Maui, you have to dedicate, you know, an hour or two of your entire trip, whether it's a week or two weeks yeah. to helping restore Lahaina, you know, going and learning about cultural experiences, going and helping replant coral reefs, plant taro, pull taro out, whatever it is, like, you know, get into the restoration and respect for the land mindset. Mm -hmm. And li like you said, like that was your most beautiful experience coming here, more so than maybe snorkeling or parasailing or a heli tour. Like you're, you're, you went away with those experiences of, you know, Hawaiian practices and learning about the culture. I don't see why the tourists coming in the future wouldn't have an incredible time learning about and getting their hands dirty and, and learning about like the rich culture here. I just think that there's so many opportunities for that. And we have a clean slate now with the rebuilding of the town. Why not implement that stuff? I don't, I don't see any negatives to it. I don't know. Yeah. I have a lot of people now writing and saying, okay, I want to help, but I don't know how to help. And I don't know where to go, where my money's actually going to go to and making sure it's going into the right hands, the people who have impacted, who people who have been impacted and it's going directly to them. What are some places that I can put in the show notes, we can put on our social medias or ways that people can buy things to help give back? Yeah, for sure. We have a GoFundMe set up. Um, it's still open right now. We were originally going to cap it at, what did we make? 300? Yeah, we got to 350. 350. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You guys, that is amazing. We saw people kept donating, like donations were still trickling through. So we, we were like, we don't want to close off that resource if people are still donating. Like we can get more money for people who need it. So we kept that open. So our GoFundMe is still available for donations. Um, so you can put the link there. And then also uh, these Lahaina Strong shirts from a company called Ert Ert. 
Uh, we did a collab with them and 100% of the proceeds from these shirts go to directly to people who are impacted by the fires. So we have those two things that we're doing personally. Um, another good place to donate if you don't want to do GoFundMe is uh, the Maui Food Bank. They're another great one. Um, and then there was another one. Maui that- Strong Fund is another one. It's a 501c3 as well. So I know some people are a little skeptical of donating to GoFundMe. It's like, I totally get that. Um, if you guys don't want to donate to our GoFundMe, um, Maui Food Bank's a great one. We work with them. Uh, and then the Maui Strong Fund. You can just look up Maui Strong Fund on, on Google. We'll give a link to you guys as well. Um, and then the t-shirts, um, like Stacy mentioned, 100% of proceeds are going to Lahaina family victims. And then we just discounted the shirts as well this week to $25. There's Ian emailed me yesterday. We have, they have 400 left. And once these are gone, they're gone. We'll never make these again. So really cool. We, we were talking about the other day, like we've seen so many around the community and there was a paddle out a weekend ago and and a bunch of people in the crowd were wearing these Lahaina Strong shirts and they had no idea Stacy and I were even involved with it. And But just seeing people, you know, walking by with them, it, it's really cool to see the support. Yeah, um, and he, he was wearing a shirt out the other day and he like, had like 10 people stop and where'd you get your shirt? So yeah. it's really cool that everybody wants to like, you know, support and give back. So. Yeah, and it's super cool. And the the money from the shirts, Ian from, from ERT is going to um, deposit it directly into our GoFundMe. Mm-hmm. And from the GoFundMe, Stacy and I have been writing checks. And so we've written so many checks. Of Good for you guys. You guys are we, just had incredible. Incredible. We, we had to buy um, another set of 80 checks because we ran out of our, our checkbook on the first one. And, and what we did to just sort of for transparency for people of how we've distributed the funds, because that was really hard for us was like, mm-hmm. we were in Denver. We're like, what can we do sitting in a freaking hotel in Denver? We said, let's set up a GoFundMe because Stacy right away had donated mm-hmm. like 50 or 100 bucks to yeah. this random, you know, Lahaina Fire one that had started. And she's like, I just donated, like, you should donate too. So yeah. I logged on or she tried to find the link for me and it said 404 expired. It like disappeared. So oh. her, her money yeah. was just gone and stolen. She's I like, like, I just gave uh, 50 bucks and now it's just gone. So she's like, this yeah. is so sketchy. There's so many of these. Like fake ones. And I was like, I don't want to like people to keep donating to these. And some of them had like a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars And I was like, okay, are these legit? So yeah. I was like, we need to do this like because we're from there and people will trust that we're actually doing a real go like GoFundMe. Yeah. So we originally set our goal to a hundred thousand thinking that was like a long shot. We were like, whatever, we'll just set it to that. And then now it's like, it's almost at 400,000, 400, which is so, amazing. And we've given yeah. almost three quarters away already. The way GoFundMe works is they transfer weekly. So we get a new lump sum every week and like drain the account, write checks, and then wait for more to transfer from GoFundMe, write more checks. And so the way we've been doing it is, and the kind of the, the, the model we came up with talking to the locals in the community was there was a bunch of leaders that kind of stood out in the community over the last couple of weeks that really helped with setting up the hubs and really being a voice in the community. So I went to them and we chose a bunch of them and said, hey, give us the names of families that you know, and we will write checks to those families. And so then it's not just people that Stacy and I know, I would say 85 to 90 percent of the checks we've written are people we've never met in our lives that were Lahaina people that lost everything. And so we give these checks to these local leaders and they're passing them out and they're FaceTiming us and sending us photos and people are so like beautiful. bawling and crying and calling. I'm getting calls from it's people. It's been emotional. <laughs> it's been a lot of tears and like happy tears because we're happy to help. But like we're telling these people like, hey, this is not from us. This is the generous mm-hmm. people who have donated. We want mm-hmm. you to know that there's thousands of donors all over the world that are supporting you guys. Mm-hmm. And this is not Stacy and I's money. We're just the, the logistics to get it to you. And mm-hmm. yeah, lots of, lots of tears shed the last few weeks, but just lots of hugs and, and people are beyond thankful. You, you have no idea like what th- it means to them. And it's, it's emotional to talk about, but we're just really grateful to be in the position just to help however we can. And, mm-hmm. and the GoFundMe is still active. We talked to the guys that we were, I was in, t- in touch with employees at GoFundMe just, Hey, how do we do this right? How do we, you know, do this properly? And they've been really good with helping guide us with with this amount of money and how to get it out. And um, and I said I want to cap this thing off because it's just so stressful dealing with all this money and yeah. and making sure it gets into the right hands properly. And they said, well, you're still receiving thousands of dollars a day a month later. That's still money people are donating that you can write checks for. And so we decided ultimately to keep it open so it's still live. I don't know when we're going to close it off. I think as when the do- donations start slowing down, we will eventually. But right now, every day we wake up and people are still donating dollar money, yeah. $5 here, $20 here, $200 yeah. here. And 
it's like you tear up. It's really, it's it's really cool. cool. It's so cool. And I, I encourage people, anyone who's been to Hawaii, any Island of Hawaii to help give back in any way. These islands are so special and they give way more to us than we can ever give back. And then it's also important to realize in times of grief, especially when there's death or these disasters is everybody wants to help at first. And it's the first part where you're receiving so much love, but it's over time where it settles then that's when it starts, the darkness starts to really creep in because everyone's gone away and the help has stopped. And these people, it's going to be years until they are even back to a semi-normal life. And I know for Kiloni and I, we are teaming up with some of the biggest um, Hawaii creators to help with Christmas time with them. And then also Kiloni is teaming up with his friend. Do you want to talk about with your so friend? So I just barely started. Like I just talked to him like two days ago. His name is Nalu Nita and he's from Maui as well. But he he does construction stuff up here, but he's working on building these like uh, these portable homes pretty much like homes that go on on uh, fo- like stilts, like on foundation and they can move them, but just temporary housing because- it, mm-hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That's like what locals are really facing right now, right? Like yeah. they don't have somewhere to live or yeah. they're staying with family to. and they're overrun because they have 20 people in one house. But like, how long can you sustain that? Right. So, yeah, exactly. Well, and with tourism coming back, there's fear that these people who are being housed in these hotel rooms temporarily, mm-hmm. you know, they get kicked out in a few weeks. Where are they going to go? And so a bunch of guys are working on these temporary, you know, tiny homes and getting them built. And so that's super cool. Um, They're asking right now, I know for like Lowe's and Home Depot gift cards, because they can go over and buy lumber and tools to keep constructing these. So I'll try to get you guys a link to the guys who are collecting those that are building. I know Keoloni probably knows those guys as well. So I mean, the the, the avenues to donate and help are just endless. Like there's so Mm -hmm. many people doing beautiful things. I know like Stacy and I early on, it was all about supplies and helping right off the bat. And now Stacy and I are just Mm -hmm. trying to be monetary help. But you know, um, helping building housing and stuff. There's so many phases to it. And talking to chemo, they're still in phase one. We're we're over a month out and phase one is still remains cleanup and toxic cleanup. So they're still in phase one of mm-hmm. cleanup, which is, you know, um, uncovering remains and removing all the toxic waste. And then I believe phase two, they'll go in and they'll remove general debris. So just scoop everything up once they've gotten all like the kind of mm-hmm. um, specific stuff out. Uh, and then phase three, I believe, will be building. So there's all these different phases and we're still in phase one. So there's a long road ahead. It's awesome that you guys are already talking about Christmas stuff because yeah. holidays are coming up and that's going to be a, a new soft spot for people. So how can we get more help then? And just keeping Lahaina in your thoughts and keeping in your prayers and, and not forgetting about it. Because like we've seen before, so many natural disasters hit. Mm-hmm. It's really exciting to talk about and cool to talk about for two weeks. And then they're forgotten about. Yeah. So. Yeah. Using well, your guys' platform is is really incredible. Yeah. And people like you guys who aren't currently on Maui, but helping from afar and doing what you can um, is super helpful. And other creators and people with a platform just, you know, if you have events coming up or ways to raise funds or help Maui, like the help is, is needed and it's going to be needed for a long time. Love that. Well, we appreciate you guys taking time to come on and we know you guys are busy and literally thank you so much for all you're doing for the people of Maui and this. And again, if you have been impacted or you love Hawaii like we have, and this has touched you, please go ahead and tag us. I'll put Slater and uh, Stacy and Kiloni's Instagram handles below. We would love to personally thank you on our social platforms and thank you for listening. And we'll see you guys next time. Appreciate Thanks you guys. So having us. We'll see you. If you were inspired by today's episode, I encourage you to tag me on social media at Kat Kamalani so I can personally thank you myself. I would love to hear your thoughts on my podcast. So go ahead and leave a review. So high five for finishing the episode and trying to better yourself. I hope you found it informative, inspiring, and thought-provoking. I will see you again soon for another episode. Take care.